Good morning, everyone. My name is Garrett Sheehan. We'll get started in just a moment. We'll let everyone get into the Zoom room and thanks for joining us this morning. All right, good morning, everyone. My name is Garrett Sheen. I'm president and CEO of the Greater New Haven Chamber of Commerce and the Quinnipiac Chamber of Commerce. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. I take pride in my business, the celebration of pride, and we know June is Pride Month, coming to uh, a rapid close here at the end of the month. Uh, before we get started, I, I wanna thank the organizations, businesses that support us here at the Chamber to be able to put on uh, this type of programming, Connecticut Natural Gas, Southern Connecticut Gas, and UI. Uh, providing our business support assistance, gave us a grant this year to be able to continue to do that, as well as all of our investors in the chamber. Um, it's through their support throughout the course of this entire year that we've been able uh, to remain staffed and to be able to put on this type of programming and provide direct assistance to businesses as we've made our way through the pandemic. So now at this point, I would like to welcome in Cecil Austin, co-chair of our Diversity and Inclusion Council. Cecil. Thanks, Garrett. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Cecil Lawson. I'm the owner of CNH Insurance and co-chair of the Diversity and Inclusion Council for the diverse, for the Greater New Haven Chamber. Um, I wanted to say thank you to all of the participants today for taking the time to come in on this discussion. Um, I'd also like to uh, encourage everyone that's on the call to uh, get involved obviously, so we can continue to move discussions like this forward. Um, and if anyone has any desire uh, to be um, a part of the Diversity Inclusion Council, please contact the chamber and um, have them include you on, include you on our distribution list. Um, so with that, I'd just like to get things going and say thank you again to everyone that's participating in today's event. Thanks, Garrett. Great. Thank you, Cecil, appreciate it. Uh, and so now we'll move to our uh, very distinguished panel that we have with us here this morning. We have Patrick Dunn, Executive Director of New Haven Pride Center, and Patrick's on the phone, so we'll pull him up in just a moment. Uh, Eric Russell is an attorney with Pullman and Comley. John Vincent Pika Sneeden, President and CEO of the Connecticut Gay and Lesbian Chamber of Commerce, and Lauren Tagliatella, Chief Community Officer Canal Crossing at Whitneyville West. And thank you all four. And Patrick, I, I know you're online. I'll, I'll get you uh, pulled in first in a moment. Um, but I want to hear from each of you as, as we talk about Pride Month and maybe some of the, the topics that are on your mind, uh, especially in terms of diversity and inclusion. We just heard from Cecil, and uh, it's a big focus here at the Chamber as we continue to move forward. So, John, maybe I'll, I'll start off with you. Okay, thank you. Uh, good morning, all. Um, I, as Garrett said, I'm John Picasnita from the Connecticut Gay and Lesbian Chamber. And um, as far as, you know, it being Pride Month, we all take, you know, pride in not only just one month, but all year long. Um, some of the things that I've been working with with a lot of our members of the Chamber and our corporate partners is the uh, diversity and inclusion. Some companies don't even know what that means. Um, so I more or less explain to them what, what that means and how we can work together to uh, support their LGBTQIA people in their, uh, in their companies. Um, not so much the smaller companies or the smaller businesses, but the larger companies. We really try to uh, educate you know, um, 
how everything is is operated, how people should be treated. So it's it's kind of like we go beyond the chamber of commerce and into almost an educating process. Um, but we are the only chamber of commerce that covers the entire state. So we have meetings. Well, now we don't have any meetings in person. We do everything via Zoom. And um, so we are a statewide, we do have statewide Zoom meetings, which is great because now people that are downstate in, in the Fairfield County area, or New London County, or New Haven County can come into our meetings and still be able to be part of the, the larger LGBT business and allied community. That's it. <laughs> Thanks, John. I appreciate Thank it. You. And we'll come back to you in just a moment. Uh, let me turn now to Lauren. And Lauren, we always always do a lot with Canal Dock Crossing and all the other uh, properties that are, that are part of your family's uh, business. Um, why don't you tell us some of the things that are on your mind as, as we uh, close out Pride Month here? Sure. Well, I'm in multifamily housing industry. So something that I'm always thinking about is discrimination in housing and how prevalent it is in the state and still in the country. Um, we're lucky to live in Connecticut, which has protected um, the LGBTQ community since 1991. We've had um, protections as a protected class. Sexual orientation was added as a protected class, along with race, color, religion, na national origin. Um, but I think it's not enough. I think we really need it at the federal level. In, basically, in 20 states, um, people are protected in the LGBTQ community, um, but 20 states obviously is not enough um, for our community. So that's something I've been thinking about a lot lately. Great, thank you. Uh, Eric, good morning. Coleman and Conley. Yep. What, what are some of the topics that are on your mind, Eric? Uh, good morning, Garrett. Uh, so I think there, there are a lot of things kicking around right now this Pride Month, but I uh, first um, would probably say that the recent Supreme Court decision um, with respect to Title VII um, and protecting the LGBTQ community with uh, in the employer-employee context. This obviously was a, a very big victory for the LGBTQ community. But as Lauren mentioned, it, it's not enough. Uh, there's still a lot of work to do. Um, I think one thing that people, and we may be talking about this a little bit later, but uh, have to remember about this decision is that it only applies to the employer-employee context. So. While we've been fortunate here in Connecticut that we have sexual orientation and gender identity as a part of our anti-discrimination statutes, um, it's not the case in the majority of states across the country. So even uh, now that, that folks are protected in the employer context, um, members of our community can still be legally discriminated against um, with respect to housing and education um, and a host of other uh, areas. So. I think that that's obviously a, a big piece of, of what's kicking around uh, nationally. I think we need to address this um, with res in, in terms of uh, federal legislation. Great, thank you. And let me now uh, bring in uh, Patrick. Patrick, can you hear us? Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you, great. Fantastic, thank you. Sorry everyone that I'm joining by phone. Uh, we have our food delivery to our pantry on Fridays, and Costco waits for no one. <laughs> um, so I guess the thing that I'm thinking about, I mean, obviously everything that everyone has already said is an important piece, but the one that I'm thinking about, particularly around diversity and inclusion issues, is that LGBTQ people or queer people are significantly underemployed, and that's been exasperated by... Um, COVID-19. And so uh, for me, when I'm thinking about like, what are the things that I'm concerned about at the end of Pride Month and, and looking ahead at what the rest of how we respond as a community to COVID and other issues that are going on is how do we ensure that our community is employed and empowered to own businesses um, and how people, you know, businesses that are LGBTQ owned survive COVID uh, and stay intact because they're vital community spaces for everyone. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I'll start with this first question for everyone. Um, you know, there's obviously been a huge awakening in America over the last uh, several weeks uh, in the aftermath of what of the tragedy with George Floyd and people rethinking um, all of their relationships, their actions. Um, 
they're separate issues, but have you noticed that, that people have had similar um, thoughts about how they they interact and and the actions they take with the uh, LGBTQ excuse me uh, community as well? Uh, Lauren, I'll, I'll start with you. I think it showed how important language is, is, is necessary for us to think before we speak and try to be more inclusive with how we describe things. Like in the housing industry, like this is a silly example, but um, you know, like a his and her sink, right? So if I'm gonna go in and give you a tour of this his this bathroom with a his and her sink, I'm uh, you know one I'm assuming you're heterosexual and maybe you're not. I don't know who you what, you know what your situation is, um, but like we have to words matter, and if we want people in you know the um, Black Lives Matter community, the LGBT community, we need to be inclusive with our language. We need people to feel like they belong with our companies, with our communities. Um, so I think it starts with language and, and um, the cultural, um, you know, your culture of your business. Like, I think you'll know very quickly where, where a company stands and, and how they treat their customers and their employees and if they have a diverse workforce. John, are you, um, are you also seeing new conversations that are occurring? Actually, no, I'm not. Um, I actually have, uh, the only time that I hear anything is, is on a national level. Um, here in Connecticut, we've, we're lucky. Um, we're extremely lucky with the amount of, of people. I, I, I just want to uh, dovetail off of what Lauren was saying as far as the, the terminologies that are being used and the discussion and the proper words. Because I think what's happening is that most people are using words wrong. And when people are talking about um, the LGBTQ community, and when they say, um, well, them, or those people, um, I guess you can lump it in with the women and the Black Lives Matter and the, his, the Latinos and all of that. When you start depicting a specific group, um, then you're, you're, you're uh, becoming a, a you're isolating a certain conversation that you're having. And we try not to do that. And, and it's very difficult, it's very difficult. But in the, as far as the business community, um, you know, a lot of the businesses right now, I haven't heard anything about anybody not being able to, um, to survive. Um, they've all did the PPP program. They, you know, they're all trying to do their best to keep on top. So I'm not really sure at this time, if that's a, a, a conversation that they would have with me right now. So, um, you know, we, we're in uncharted waters here, as everybody has been saying, the governor has been saying it. There's, there's so much of the unknown of what, especially in the business community, um, you know, so many people have been affected by this. Uh, you know, in, in their pockets, in their, their finances. Some businesses will not open. Um, I hope that's not the case. Um, you know, we're trying to do everything to give everybody the opportunity to be relevant. So um, I, I haven't. So I haven't really heard anything negative about, um, you know, what's going on or with, within themselves. And I do allow people to talk to me, you know, I, in my meetings, in my Zoom meetings, I always say, you know, feel free to email me if you have any questions about anything. And, uh, and, and people have. Um, we're trying to start different kinds of programs to, it, it really is uh, uncharted territory right now. So um, I don't know if anybody else is feeling that, but I know that we are, uh, you know, trying to make everything relevant, no sports. Okay. And, and, and we have, um, you know, an enormous amount of, of people in the state of Connecticut that love their sports. And uh, last week I had on my Zoom meeting, uh, the Connecticut Sun, they're a member of our chamber. And um, we were able to um, have them come on, the coach, the manager, uh, the, yeah, I think the manager, and, uh, and talk about what they're doing and how. And I was talking about having these um, watch parties. So 
again, trying to keep everything relevant and, and trying not to be so, um, yes, we're gay, yes, we're LGBTQ, you're straight, you're doing it this way. We try to blend it where we're all talking about the same thing. It's not easy. That's true. Um, Patrick, let me, let me just follow up on that as well. And, and, you know, part of the reason I asked that question is that, I mean, I think we can all notice as a society as a whole, we, we focus on uh, one thing and, and definitely this is the area we need to focus on uh, racism right now. Uh, but too, too many times we just focus on one issue and we tend to drop all the other issues uh, that are out there or not take a, a, a global view of, of other impacts that are going on. And so that's why I ask, you know, about, um, you know, if that conversation of inclusivity um, is extending to all parts of society where there has been exclusion. And, and do you feel like that conversation, I guess, needs to occur uh, as it relates to the LGBTQ community? Yeah, I mean, I'm a, I'm a firm proponent of intersectionality. Um, you know, women's issues are queer issues, black and brown uh, issues are, and racial justice issues are queer issues because they affect us just as much as they do a heterosexual person um, or a non-queer person. And so for, from my perspective, really, when we're talking about racial justice or we're talking about income inequality or we're talking about uh, women's reproductive rights, all of these things directly tie back to our community because they affect our community. Um, you know, one of the things that I always say about the LGBTQ community is, is like, the best part of it is, is that we have a little bit of everybody in our community, which is why we're, we use the rainbow as our symbol um, and why there's so many letters in our name. And, and that's, it's really because we are so diverse. We do represent so many different um, groups and you know there's people within our community that that might be marginalized because they're LGBTQ but then also marginalized because they're a woman and also are marginalized because they're black and you need to really be able to look at that intersectionality um, across how all three of those minority groups might affect that person in kind of walking through society um, you know I, I am gonna I'm gonna disagree with John a little bit um, you know I think I think that there's yes I agree that we have some really great protections in our state but um, you know there's still a lot of discrimination that happens towards LGBTQ people in business environments I mean um, you know we have laws that theoretically protect employees in Connecticut and we have for years um, but yet I got a call on Friday from um, someone in the community who's being harassed or being trans by her employer so like that's still happening and I think to pretend that it's not happening is is um, or be not aware that it's still happening is is I think the nature of us living in a state that does have so many amazing laws and protections um, as Eric mentioned um, and, and, and I think this is, again, going back to like this idea of language. Language is so, so important. Um, and, and, you know, we need to, to keep our eye on things, even, even wins, because wins don't mean that the problem goes away. Thanks, Patrick. Um, Eric, uh, you know, your comments on that, and then also um, wanted to talk a little bit more about the Supreme Court case and, and what it does mean, you know, beyond the employer-employee um, relationship. We know Supreme Court cases uh, try to be narrow, but I'm sure uh, that that's opened the door now for some of these other cases to try to come in as well. Sure, Gary. So I think to go back to just what we were talking about with George Floyd, I've actually seen, it's been really interesting for me um, being both a member of the black community and uh, being gay and kind of seeing this all play out. And uh, I've been conflicted in a way with celebrating pride how I normally kind of would because of everything that's going on nationally. Um, and it's, it's been really exciting for me to see this, right? I think one, there, while these issues and causes that have impacted the black community and the LGBT community are very different, I think there's some similarity or some level of understanding from uh, both communities that can, under, they, they know what it's like to be discriminated against and oppressed in some way. And I think because of a lot of the protections that we have in Connecticut, um, I've seen a lot of the folks that were originally involved in the LGBT community, uh, movement here jump onto the Black Lives Matter movement um, and really be strong advocates for the Black community. And it's been, it's been awesome to see that. The reality is that um, I think one thing we don't talk about enough uh, within the LGBTQ community is the fact that um, our, the Black members of our community are still discriminated against at uh, much higher rates I think especially when you start talking about the trans community um, and the fact that, you know, 
the large majority of murders of trans people um, in our community are, are black trans women. And you don't hear about it, it's not spoken about, but that discrimination all, also flows down to employment and housing and everything else that kind of goes along with that. Um, and when we're talking about kind of what started the LGBT movement, we talk about Stonewall 51 years ago was started by trans women of color. That's how this movement started. So I think there is, again, this intersectionality and overlap between uh, some of these issues. Um, the difference, obviously, with the Black Lives Matter movement is I think it's, when we start talking about racism and getting into a lot of these subjects, we have to, these are much more deeply rooted issues that really extend back uh, much further in our country. And I think in order to address a lot of those problems, we have to actually start talking about it. We have to talk about the history around this. We have to talk about the systemic issues and how um, many of these systems were put in place to oppress people of color. And even today, some of those systems still remain, and many of them, even if they weren't designed that way, are still having that effect. And um, here in Connecticut, in effect, our schools are still segregated. Um, our education uh, system is not equal depending on where you live. Um, and it runs the gamut. Housing is a huge one. We've talked about, there was a, a great panel yesterday um, discussing zoning laws and how much that impacts people of color um, because it ultimately has been a way of segregating so many communities in Connecticut. So um, I, I think I think we have to talk about all of these things together. One thing that I've been um, encouraged by is that there's so many people who have historically have not been directly impacted by um, a lot of these issues that are stepping up to the plate because people are starting to realize how much of an issue this is. Um, and they're willing to lend their voice to communities that they don't belong to. Um, and I, in a lot of ways, that's why the LGBTQ community and movement moves so quickly is because it impacted every aspect of people's lives. Everyone knows someone who belongs to the community um, and people who don't belong to the community started to take interest and were willing to use their voices and, and positions of power um, to move this, this along. So we've been having conversations within the firm. I've, I've had conversations in the business context and with clients that I would never ever dream that I would have had before. Um, people really looking for ways to step up to the plate, how they could be a partner in this, how they could be an ally. Um, so it, it is encouraging. Well, thanks, Eric. Um, actually, I'll come back to you on the, the legal question because you did raise something else that I want to, um, and maybe Patrick, I'll jump to you on this. Um, even within the LGBTQ community, um, are, are there different levels of acceptance? Um, you know, I think Eric just brought up that trans, transgender, um, you know, there's much more crime uh, that's out there. Um, what's your thought on that? Is it is uh, is not everyone in the same position, I guess, and is there different levels of acceptance that are out there? So I, I don't I don't know if I would use the word ex different levels of acceptance or the phrase different levels, just because I don't want to debate people's um, experiences and and place value over one over another. I will say that when you statistically look at experiences, um, there are di there are very clear distinctions where certain identities have a very different experience of the world than others. Um, for example, um, bisexual women are more likely to be victims of domestic violence than pretty much any other group of people. Um, you know, uh, transgender folks of color are high, uh, are much higher likely to be underemployed and um, have to rely on non-traditional methods to earn income. Um, so, you know, like, I think, yes, we can, you can definitely look at the statistic and see there are trends within specific identities, often paired with other um, minority factors. Um, you know, I wouldn't blanketly want to be like, all oh, trans people have a worse experience than gay men, because like, that's, that's not a fair comparison. But I think if you start really looking at the statistics and the data, you start seeing um, different levels of discrimination. And, and I think, you know, tying it to the business community, when you look at business interactions that people have, um, you know, you're going to also see similarly when people carry multiple minority identities, um, they're probably more likely experiencing discrimination, underemployment, um, you know, not being able to maybe get the business, same business loan that somebody else might get. Um, 
and so on and so forth. And so Eric, I'll, I'll turn back to you on the, the Supreme Court decision and, and how does that get extended beyond just the employer employee relationship or do you see even, and maybe you're aware, are there cases that are making their way through the courts, the Supreme Court, um, or, or do you think it'll have to happen more through a legislation? So I believe there are some cases, but this was the, the biggest one that was kind of on, I, I think related to this subject and I, I could be wrong there. Um, but I, the Equality Act is currently pending in uh, Congress right now. So the Equality Act would be in effect would be much like Connecticut's statutes are where you would sexual orientation and gender identity would be added to anti-discrimination statutes across the board. So rather than it just being applied in title, the Title VII context, it would also be applied to housing and education um, in healthcare. And, you know, regardless, not to get political here, right, but we have to also be realistic about the fact that the current administration has been um, incredibly detrimental to the LGBTQ community in every context and has rolled back protections in healthcare. Now it's, there's no longer a prohibition on discrimination in, for, uh, in the healthcare industry. So members of our community um, can, can be denied access to treatment um, by doctors and healthcare institutions. Uh, it, there has been attacks on um, same-sex adoptions. I mean, the list goes on and on, trans folks in the military. I think it's been especially hard um, or especially directed at the trans community. Um, but these are things that we, we have to talk about. I think it's the first way to change these things because politically people need the backing and the support from individuals and from our business community to to know that they're going to be able to, to push what's right and, um, and be supported in that. Um, but the Equality Act, I think, is, is the biggest piece right now, I think. So it, it's been passed in the House and is currently, um, it's been in sitting on Mitch McConnell's desk for a little over a year now. So uh, I think that would be a, a huge step in the right direction. John, uh, let me turn to you. Uh, for the chamber, the Gay and Lesbian Chamber, how, how do you uh, address these issues and then also support gay and lesbian businesses? What are some of the activities, programs that you guys take on? Um, <clears throat> there's a lot of things that, you know, it was, it was great to hear that, uh, you know, that that law passed uh, last week. And um, I haven't heard of any, um, any people you know, it's funny because uh, unlike other people, we are a business or organization. So I'm not gonna hear the social end of people or if somebody's gonna be discriminated against, they're not gonna, they're not gonna talk to me about it. Um, so it's, you know, I'm, I'm sort of at a, a, a loss right now to, um, <clears throat> to have anything to contribute because most of the things that we do are, <clears throat> business promoting and helping to sustain businesses. If somebody came to me and said to me about, um, you know, that they were discriminated, <laughs> that they were discriminated about, uh, about their, their orientation at a company, I would be the first one to be knocking on their door and, and fighting for them. And only because sexual orientation should not and ever have anything to do with your your work ethic, your work ability. And anybody that brings in your sexual orientation or you, if you're a transgender, bisexual, it doesn't really make any difference. If you're continuing to do the work that you're supposed to be doing, then nobody should be able to have that moment of saying to you, you're fired because of your sexual orientation. Not only is that the most ridiculous comment, not only is that just the most stupid, way of dealing with something. But, you know, the LGBTQ people, if you're born in this country, we're Americans. Doesn't matter what color you're, you're you come under, black, brown, white, yellow, red, it doesn't matter. If you were born in this country, then you deserve to have every right as an American citizen. So nobody has the right to tell you who to love, who to sleep, who, nobody has the right to tell you that. And if this administration in Washington keeps pull, rolling back what we've already accomplished, the only thing that's gonna happen is we're going to fight back. We've been fighting for the last 51 years. We're not gonna stop. 
So if this law that changed last week is something that is just that much closer to hopefully what Eric was talking about with the next uh, laws that are pending, they're just going to be, we're just going to keep pushing through. As far as support here in Connecticut to any LGBT businesses, what I'm finding is that when I took over as, um, as the executive director um, of about six years ago, I would say 75% were non-LGBT businesses, maybe 20, 25% were LGBT businesses. As of today, we have probably 50-50. So more and more people are understanding that they can be themselves, you know, at least here in Connecticut. Um, I can't speak for any other states because I only work in the state of Connecticut, with the state of Connecticut. Um, and they're, they're feeling a little more proud to come out. We give them the opportunities to share their information with all of the members. We give them the opportunity to have these different events that we hold, different um, presentations. Everybody has the opportunity to talk about themselves. You know, and so I think that's really what we get to offer the LGBTQ community, not only the businesses, but our nonprofits. So for people like Patrick and uh, at the New Haven Pride Center, Triangle Community Center, the Hartford Gay and Lesbian Health Collective, the True Colors uh, Organization in Hartford, everybody has the opportunity to talk about what they're doing and how, and we promote it. We promote it because that's what we do. So I think that we show a great support, uh, support system, but again, and I have to make this very clear to everybody, we are strictly business. We're not political. We don't back any political parties. We don't black back political people. So we're very much a business oriented place. So people feel comfortable. They can do whatever they want. They can be whatever color they want. They can Thank be you. whatever religion they want. And I think that's important that Have people can do that. You know, that they are welcome and that they, they belong. We always give that opportunity of telling them they belong here. Thank you. And thanks, John. Um, a question for everyone, and we, and we do have a, we have a lot of businesses that are uh, joining us on the line today. And um, I'll start with you, Lauren, because you kind of touched on this on one of the, the previous questions when you were talking about the his and her bathrooms. So what are the types of things that businesses can do uh, to support their LGBTQ employees or customers, um, things that they may not even be aware of right now, but that um, impact uh, their employees and customers in ways that they don't realize. And, and, I'll, and again, I'll go to everyone, but uh, you had a great example uh, for any other things that come to mind that, that uh, just on an awareness factor even that, that uh, our businesses can take on. Well, you know, what's funny is I have a Subaru, which is sort of a stereotypical lesbian vehicle. <laughs> um, but the thing about Subaru and why I'm happy to support Subaru is that they have a rainbow sticker on all of their deep de dealerships. Um, they specifically tell me I'm welcome there. Um, so I think if businesses are trying to court the LGBT community, you have to show some sort of physical signage or something that says you are welcome here. We value you. Um, you know, we've all heard about the bakery that um, refused to bake a wedding cake for a gay couple. It makes zero business sense for this bakery to say, no, I'm, I'm going to go help the straight couple, but I'm not going to help a gay couple. Like it doesn't, it, discrimination, even if you believe in discrimination, it makes no business sense to discriminate. Like it doesn't, like what's the point of being in business if you're not making a cake for everyone? Um, so, so with my example of Subaru, they're just so outward, outwardly open about how they're kind of courting the gay community to, to buy from them and be, you know, be welcome in, in their dealerships. Um, yeah, I really, I don't know what else to say on that. That's a great point. Uh, Eric, any, any thoughts on the same question? Yeah, so I would say um, first is, is building an inclusive environment. I think um, building an inclusive organization first, right? So I, I, there's the business, the outward business side of it. Um, I think it's, it's something at Pullman that we've done a lot of work on. Um, I think the firm has always been very inclusive, but we've also made sure that we've taken tangible steps to kind of further that. We've, um, we've done regular 
diversity trainings and implicit bias training so that everyone, all of our staff, all of our attorneys understand a lot of these issues and um, kind of the nuances around them and how they're interacting with people in the firm. Um, I think it's important because not only is it um, in order to attract talent within your organization, you want to make sure you have an inclusive environment for them to join so that you can actually diversify. Um, but it's also how folks within your organizations are interacting with people outside of them. Um, and I think just in, in addition to just being accepting, I think celebrating differences between people, I think making sure that you are acknowledging everyone in your organization for who they are and, and celebrating those things that come along with it. Um, and I think community participation is big. And I, I think this ties in one of my, my points was going to be a rainbow sticker outside of your uh, business may not seem like a big deal. It's a huge deal to members of the community because people want to know that they are supporting organizations that support them and that are not discriminatory and that, you know, so I, small things like that, but I think being involved in your local New Haven Pride Centers and being involved in, um, it, it doesn't need to be political organizations, but organizations that are contributing to the LGBTQ community or any other you know, minority uh, communities that you are serving. So small things, but I, I think it's really important. Great point. Uh, Patrick, same question for you, and then we'll get to John. Yeah, I mean, I think if you're if you're trying to create, you know, kind of, I'm just going to keep rolling with what Eric kind of touched on. I think, you know, building an environment that um, is really taking in consideration your employees and or and or your customers' um, identity and respect them from an authentic place is really important. Like, yes, a sticker. I agree. Like having some kind of indication publicly um, that you support the LGBTQ plus community is amazing and. Um, definitely makes you make me as a customer notice you but um, I also want to know it's coming from an authentic place that you you are actively looking at policies and um, you know environments within your own business to make sure your employees are having a good experience with your your position you know at your business you know a lot of these bigger businesses have the affiliation groups a lot of bigger businesses are making notice about things like wanting to have gender neutral bathrooms in their facilities you know these little things that you can do that really don't cost you anything as a business owner can make a huge difference for our community um, and can also make a much better working environment for your employees who might be a member of the LGBTQ plus community. John? Yeah, the, um, before the CTGLC rebranded, it was called CABO, which is, was the Connecticut Alliance for Business Opportunity. And it was started in 2007. And uh, the reason why it was started was exactly what people are talking about right now, Lauren and Patrick and Eric. Um, <clears throat> we as, as LGBT people were being discriminated against, but yet we still had to buy from companies that you know, were hating us. I'm not gonna mention one um, chicken place right now that you know, I, haven't, I haven't stepped foot in and I will not. But um, with that said, the reason why we, it was started, but if you notice that there was no um, LGBTQ um, 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 in that, it was just the Cabo, Connecticut Alliance for Business Opportunity. 13 years ago, 14 years ago, you could not use the word gay or lesbian or bisexual or transgender in any kind of acronym. And because nobody would buy you, nobody would, nobody would support you. Think about 13, 14 years later, and now we're able to do that. So there are so many companies right now. Uh, in fact, I've, I've tasked the board, my board, to, to come up with a logo, with our logo and a sticker that we can give to our members so they can put it on their windows, their cars, wherever they want to put it. Um, and so, because it, it is so important, and even with our corporate, uh, corporate partners, like travelers, if you go to our website, you can see travelers actually changed. They didn't change their little red umbrella and travelers, but there's a line and just see what's after that. It says the best place for LGBT to work. So um, we have been trying desperately to change. And I, I talked to the different uh, Foxwoods, the American Cancer Society, all of these people, if you put your logo next to our logo, so if you see travelers next to the CTGLC, 
that speaks volumes to the LGBT community and just what everybody was talking about. Like Lauren was saying about the, the Subaru. My husband and I, whenever we would travel with our kids, we would always stay at a Marriott because Marriott has always been a very welcoming uh, place for LGBT people. We would go up to the counter and they, didn't, they wouldn't say, do you need double beds? It's the simple words like Lauren was saying before about double sinks. And so those are the kinds of things that we try to change in people's minds. Um, the other thing was, um, um, yep, now I just had a senior moment, so uh, give me a second. Um, we, we can come back to you, John. Well, um, the, thing is, though, the thing is though, it, it's very important that, um, that branding people with logos and, and with LGBT logos, it's very important for businesses. You know, as uh, we get close to wrapping up here, um, I do want to recognize that, uh, as we mentioned, June is Pride Month. It's very different this year, I'm sure, in many ways. I know of parades that have been canceled, other things have been canceled because of COVID-19. But um, maybe if each of you uh, give us a final comment, but also just talk about Pride Month, uh, what that means to you and, and how uh, business should recognize the month and, and how that uh, promotes the cause overall. So uh, let me start with you, uh, Patrick. I'm going to unmute your phone here. Um, so, uh, you know, I think this year's Pride has given all of us a really interesting and great opportunity to reconnect with the roots of why we celebrate Pride, um, which is, uh, you know, Pride, Pride has started as a riot. It started as um, as Eric mentioned, black and brown, trans folk and lesbians fighting against police uh, brutality and discrimination. And, you know, to look at how far we have come in 51 years, it's amazing. I mean, it, you know, as John just mentioned, you know, things like gay and lesbian couldn't even be mentioned really in a business world in the 70s and 80s, uh, you know, when men were, were being diagnosed with HIV. Um, you know, they could lose their jobs over that um, in the 80s and, and even early 90s. And so it's really amazing to stop and like appreciate how far we've come from that moment 51 years ago, uh, which the anniversary would be tomorrow. Um, but I also think it's important to, to stop and think like, so we can't celebrate, we can't do what we normally do. So what does that mean? And how do we, how do we look inward as a community and, and start to break down some of our own stigmas and own, own kind of um, challenges we have within our community to make our community even stronger moving forward. And I think being able to connect in a wholly new way virtually um, and build this whole new community online really gives us that opportunity. So that's, that's kind of how I'm feeling about Pride this year. Great, thank you, Patrick, appreciate it. John, same question for you. Um, well, being probably the oldest person on this panel um, and have been around since Stonewall and um, all the way up to last week with the, the, uh, the, the new law passing uh, as far as not discriminating against uh, you know, same-sex people at the, the workplace. Um, I have, uh, I, I'm very proud of the fact that we've come so far, you know, um, just in the last few years. And I think we could, the, the, our history and the people that started it 51 years ago um, would look down upon us and they would smile because we're still continuing the fight. So I take pride in that. As far as the pride events that go around the state, there are 22 pride events that happened last year around the state of Connecticut. From Litchfield to, to New London, from Fairfield to, well, not so much the quiet corner, um, but they had some kind of events up there. And so um, I think at this point with the COVID and uh, I think with, you know, people are, feel like they're, they're being stifled. So they're doing all of these virtual uh, pride events. Uh, you just have to go to any of the, the LGBT organizations and, uh, you know, to find out when they are. In fact, after this meeting, I'm heading over to West Hartford to, uh, they're doing a dedication over there of the painted uh, sidewalk, uh, I'm sorry, street. And so, um, there's, there's many things that we can do. Be protective, you know, be smart, wear a mask. If you need to have gloves, wear gloves, wash your hands. I mean, I don't think you need to be a rocket scientist to figure out that that actually works. Uh, just listen to the CDC. Um, the other thing is that um, when it comes down to uh, pride itself, 
I think we as an, a community, um, all colors, all walks of life, all religions, we do stand shoulder to shoulder and we do help and protect each other. Um, you're right, I think that, you know, we do discriminate against each other. Um, and I, I don't like that myself. I, I just don't think that's necessary. I think I used to say this to a friend who used to knock a lot of the, the, the gay people. And I'd say, don't you think we get knocked enough by the straight community that we don't have to do it to ourselves? And um, of course they didn't listen, they continued to do it, but that's them. Um, but I think overall, and I wanna be able to give enough time to everybody, um, I wanna thank, this is my final thing, I wanna thank Garrett and the, the, the Greater New Haven Chamber for giving us the opportunity to talk about you know, um, issues or just being LGBT people in the state of Connecticut and supporting us as a community and in my case, as a business community. And I thank you for that. Um, anybody that wants any kind of information about the CTGLC, just go to our website, ctglc.org. Reach out to me at any time and I'll be sure to answer you immediately. If I don't answer immediately, I'm dead. <laughs> Thanks, John. Appreciate it. Lauren? John, we need to connect later. My hotel would be perfect member for you guys. Absolutely. Uh, favorite point resort and in. Um, the question is how, how can we be mindful of pride in a business sense? Yeah. Well, I think it comes from marketing. Like we need to make sure um, we're marketing and that it's inclusive marketing, right? That um, for housing, that we're showing pictures not just of one type of family and one type of color. We need to um, show the whole gamut. Um, and, um, you know, and, and as we've been saying, you know, I am more likely to stay somewhere that's either gay owned or gay friendly. Um, I will travel to countries that have protections for, for gay couples. Um, you know, so it's the same with business. If you are outward with your policies and, um, you know, your culture, you're transparent about, your inclusivity, then um, that's really all you can do to, to show, um, you know, put your, your mouth where your money is, I guess, or your money where your mouth is. <laughs> but yeah, you, you have to be leaders in our community and show that uh, we're welcoming to all. Thanks, Lauren. And uh, Eric, I'll give you the last word. Thanks, Garrett. And I first want to thank you and the chamber and, and Jesse and Cecil for organizing this. I think um, this isn't a conversation that's happened enough in the business setting. So I think it's really, uh, it's really great to put this together. Um, I think celebrating pride again, I, I think it's been a little bit tough for me with everything going on, but I do think it's a time for us to one, honor the people that have come before us and really pave the way for us to, to be where we are today and having conversations like this. Um, so many people in Connecticut and so many organizations across the country have put in so much work to, um, around these issues. So I think that that's uh, really great. Um, but I think it's an opportunity for all of us to reflect on what we're doing. And I think it's, this is certainly around the LGBT community, but I think as a whole, I think everything that's taking place right now um, gives us a chance to really look inwardly at ourselves and at our organizations and question what we're doing to um, make sure that communities that have been um, underserved and oppressed and not as well represented um, are given some of those opportunities. So, you know, I, I think making sure that we're building um, inclusive organizations, making sure that we are um, looking to hire folks um, who are members of minority communities and the LGBT community within our organizations, um, I think is all really important and is a good opportunity to uh, kind of move a lot of these issues along. So I appreciate uh, you including me and, and appreciate the conversation with all of the other uh, panelists today. Oh, thanks a lot. And thank you to uh, all of our panelists for being on with us and having such an open discussion. Uh, I do want to recognize Jesse from the staff, Jesse Phillips, who helped put this together, and obviously our Diversity and Inclusion Council uh, that's been doing a great job on trying to bring more issues to the forefront. So thank you again. Um, and I should mention we put all of our webinars onto our YouTube channel, so we'll have this one on there uh, by Monday at the latest. And so if anyone who wants to go and, and see it again or missed it, you want to pass it on to someone uh, please let them know they can go there. Thank you again to everyone. Appreciate it. Have a great weekend. Thank you, Garrett. Thank you. Thanks, Garrett.